Chapter 22 18.1 Hours 198-776-M41 Fifth Compartment, Sparsmann's Auction 60s Novabaski! Roan yelled. Oh, what? The Commissar stammered. Novabaski! The weapon! Gendi Novreski, quite enamored with the first glimpse of the mature stalker, slowly remembered who and what and where he was, and started fumbling with the plasma pistol Hawk had given him. Hit it! Coleslim bellowed. The stalker was coming forward, increasing speed. Its throat sacks puffed out like bellows, and its vast jaws opened to allow the steel teeth to engage. The hunting party opened fire. Ten las rifles on full auto lit up the clearing with the blitz of laser fire. Shrugging it off, the monster came on, turning its bounding progress into a pounce. The guards went scattered in desperation. Mags managed to smash Novrobeski over the side tackle that saved both their lives. The stalker went over them and caught Villard in the mouth. The Belladon screamed the most appalling scream any of them have ever heard as the stalker's massive bite sheared him apart. Val turned and began firing at the huge brute. Val was no fool. He knew full well he couldn't kill the creature with his Mark III. He was trying to hit Villard. He was trying to spare the poor fool any more agony. Busy with its kill, the stalker lashed out with its left paw and smacked Val into the air. He hit a tree, snapped it, and tumbled onto the cold ground. Mags rolled off Novreski. The plasma gun! The plasma gun! He yelled. I can't work the safety! The Kamazar babbled, fighting with Hawk's favorite weapon. I can't get it to... Mags snatched the pistol out of Novreski's hand. He slid the toggle and aimed at the stalker. The huge beast turned, its muzzle slick with Villard's blood. It hooted and roared, and began to charge the Belladon scout with like a fighting bull. Eat this! Said Mags, and fired and seared beam from the plasma vaporized the stalker's enormous skull in an astonishing burst of blood and bone chips. But the sheer momentum of the thrice route's attack carried its mammoth headless carcass on. It slammed at the mags and knocked him backwards through the air. Limbs flailing, a look of despair on his face. Mags fell backwards into the hole and vanished. The headless stalker collapsed onto the soil in front of the shimmering gate. Mags! Bonin shouted and ran towards the hall. McCall was right behind him. Feth! Bonin said, coming to a halt in front of the hall. He reached out his hand and the light rippled like water around his fingertips. Mags! Mags! Bonin looked at McCall. Never leave a man behind, McCall said and leapt through the portal. McCall, no! Bonin roared. There was a shout from behind him. Crid had opened up. A second stalker, the one that had been trailing them, exploded out of the tree line and came lumbering across the clearing towards Bonin. The tenth scout dived away, coming up to spatter last shots into the thing's flank as it turned. It wasn't as big or mature as a beast that had come out of the hole, but it was still big enough. Three hundred kilos plus, thick with muscle, its plated skull half a meter long, its teeth the size of fingers. It made for Bonin, roaring. Rifle fire smacked into it from the left and forced it to turn away. Cole Slim and Crid were coming forward, firing at it, trying to distract it from Bonin. Their effect worked. It went for them instead. Dillian Baldin landed on his back. He stabbed his straight silver down the rear of the monster's skull. Black blood burst up across the hands and forearms. The stalker convulsed and bucked, throwing Belton off its back like an unbroken horse. Hurt, panting, its throat sacs swelling in and out like a respirator pump, the stalker took a few unsteady steps. Belton's dagger was still buried in the back of its head. Roan stepped towards it. There was something in his hand. Hello, you, he said. The beast turned, blood dripping from its gigantic mouth. It gurgled and opened its jaws, slotting its teeth in and out of position as it tasted a new target to bite. Rune threw the tube charge into the wide smile. The stalker's jaws closed. There's a brief rumble, 
and then it blew apart, showering the whole clearing with greasy blood and lumps of meat. Roan wiped the hot, rank gore off his face. All right. Mach. Bonin got to his feet and nodded. Crid, Coslim, Bell. I'm fine, said Beldon. He looked at Bonin. Back of the skull, that's what you told me. Back of the skull, you said. You did fine, Bonin replied. He wasn't really interested. He was gazing at the boulder. The gate had closed. It was just a boulder again. McCall, come back. Mags, respond. Belton delicately adjusted the dials of his Voxcaster. Uh, McCall, this is a hunting party. Do you receive? Maybe you broke the caster jumping on the thing's back, Bonin suggested. Well, I wouldn't have done it if an idiot thing like that. If you hadn't told me the back of the skull was the weak spot, Belton snapped. The way for me, Bonin said. Children, hush, said Roan. Bell, any joy yet? Belton shook his head. Something's awry. Not picking up mags or the chief, but they're close. I mean, I got their signals. I'm picking up their macrobeats. Why can't we talk to them? Coslam asked. Belton shrugged. Microbead links have a range of about ten kilometers, tops. Major, this baby... He patted the Voxcaster set. Well, she's good for global work. The point is, uh, look here. Belton indicated a particular gauge on the Vox set. That's the rangefinder. We call it the booster. CC, how it's hunting. What does that mean? Crid asked. It means, it means something's, um, all right. Belton replied. I got signals from the microbeads, which suggest they're somewhere within a ten-kilometer spread from here. But the set is hunting madly for a fix, like they're also out of range. Out of range, said Roan. Out of global range, Wilton shook his head. I can't explain it. They're close by, but they're also not actually on. His voice trailed away. Not actually on actual on Sextus anymore. Well finished. Um, yes, sir. I said it was a rye. Rune turned away. How's Varl? He asked. Corthios. So, said Beldon. He'll live. All right, Novobraski, Rune said. I froze, Novobraski said. I'm sorry. I've never seen anything like that before. I still can't. No blame, Brown said. It was a shock for us all. Sir, Belton cried. I have something. Throne, it's coming through. It's like it's on a delay. Why would it be on a delay? Speaker, Brown demanded. Belton threw a switch to the Voxcaster. They all stood silently as the crackling, distorted voices breathed out of the Vox set. Shithole now. It's not good, is it? This is what you meant? The shit you can get me in if you really tried. Shut up, Mags. The sky. The hell's wrong with the sky? The friggin' stars were wrong. They're just wrong. It's so friggin' cold. Shut up. So cold, like... Look at the roof. Why? It's like a roof. I, I mean, the ceiling, stones. Huge stones. Uh, what's holding them up? Shut up. McCall. McCall. We're picking you up. Belton said. Respond. Are we? I mean, we're... I swear, Mags, if you don't shut... Belton. Belton. Is that you? This is McCall. I can read you, but you're not clear. Say again. Belton keyed the send button. McCall, this is Bell. We're reading you. Over. Can no longer hear you. If you can hear me, get Roan to the set. I'm here, Roan said. 
getting nothing over the microbeads. I hope you can hear me. Tell Rome we're not on Oxygen 60s anymore. Tell Rome. Places like a vast chapel. There's no supports for the roof. Stones hanging in the air. Makes me want to cry. It's impossible. Mags has lost it. There are stalkers all here, all around us, hundreds of them, climbing the rocks towards us. I think they've got our scent. The pistol! Give me the fucking plasma pistol, Mags! They're coming for us! Give... Come on, move, don't... This way, keep... Right behind us, keep moving for now. For our best sakes, we... A hideous roar burst out of the Voxcaster speakers, and the channel went dead. A flat noise droned out over it. Oh, throne, Crid said. All of them winced as a bomb went off 300 meters west. With Roan in the lead, they started running towards a blast, weapons raised. Varl, Bonin, and Crid fanned out ahead, scoring the woodland rifles at their shoulders. Clear! Clear this way! Over here! Bonin cried out. The hunting party ran to him. He was hunched over in another clearing beside another huge stone. McCall and Mags were sprawled at his feet, lifeless, caked in frost. The corpse of a stalker lay nearby, its skull destroyed by the tube charge. Roan knelt down beside McCall and cradled his head. Chief. McCall's eyes open, slowly blinking. Gaunt was right. He gasped. Gaunt was right. Chapter 23 Zero one. Zero five hours. One nine nine seven seven six M forty one. Third compartment Sparshmon's auction sixties. Gaunt woke to find Ezra shaking him by the shoulder. For a moment he thought he was still on Grillion, in the gloom of the until, but this was a different kind of darkness. He remembered where he really was. He peered at his chronometer. Its glass had been shattered some time during the previous two days. It was still the dead of night. He'd been asleep in the back of the salamander for less than three hours. He remembered climbing into it for rest for just a minute, and then nothing. Exhaustion and overwhelmed him. What is it? he asked. As were appointed, a young Bina corporal was waiting beside the command thread. His uniform was torn and blotched with mud. Gaunt slid down from the tread's bay. Every atom of him ached, and some pieces of him hurt a great deal more than that. He was slightly dizzy and disintorated. Yes, he said. The corporal saluted. Commissar Gaunt? Yes. A message for you, sir. It came through to my Vox station. It says it's urgent. Gaunt nodded and rummaged for his cap. He followed the young soldier back to the rutted trackway. A kilometer behind them, the battle still raged. It was just entering its third day. Somehow, it had endured thus far. Somehow, they had held that narrow, precious line and kept the enemy at bay. The previous afternoon reinforcements had begun to arrive. By the evening, the Fortis Biners and their allied units had finally been able to retire from the front and rest. Gaunt glanced back as he walked down the track. The blackness of the night had been thickened into an almost solid mass by the smoke, and this darkness was underlit by a throbbing orange glow from the vast fire zones along the front line. The crackle and shriek of munitions continued to echo up the finned positions. Gunships swirled through the murk overhead. All down the long trackway, men slept or rested in jumbled troop trucks and fighting vehicles. Most of them were biners. Many of them were wounded. The worst of the injured had been evacuated out in slow-moving processions to post 10. Gaunt and the corporal reached the Vox station, set up in one of the clusters of happy tents beside the trackway. Figures. Mainly junior officers milled about, dead on their feet from fatigue. 
The corporal showed Gaunt over to one of the casters, where the operator made some deft connections and handed a headset to Gaunt. He removed his cap and slid the set on. This is Gaunt. Roan, we got what you need, sir. Confirm that. Roan, you have proof over. Corporation, Brahm. It's solid. Over. Where are you? Over. Post 13, 5th compartment. That's 13, 36, and the 5th over. Stay there. I'm coming for you. Go there. Gaunt handled the set back to the le and left the tent. Ezra was waiting for him outside, despite the fact that he'd been in the thick of battle for as long as Gaunt. The ninth gain seemed untroubled by any sign of fatigue. Come on, Gaunt said to him, he began to walk down, track away from the boom of war. Rise, dear, Ezra called out. Gaunt turned. Partition was hanging back, glancing behind him up the track. What? Gaunt asked. Lud, Ezra said. Last time Gaunt had seen Lud, the young man had been unconscious from exhaustion in the seat of a cargo tent, parked off the road. Gaunt shook his head. Not this time. Come on. They followed the track for about a kilometer, stepping out of the road from time to time as a heavy transport and armored cars went by, moving up towards the line. The landscape on either side of them was clogged with troop trucks and munition fighters, along with the tracks and, and chimeras preparing to advance. A broad patch of bare earth was being used as a forward landing strip for gunships and Valkyries. Six of the machines were on the ground, surrounded by prep crews and field bowsers. Gaunt let Ezra pass the team of bombardiers offloading tank shells from a payload bay of one of the battered Valkyries, and approached the next in line. The pilot, who had been resting on the ground beside his machine, jumped up when he saw the commissar approaching. You filled him prepped? Gaunt asked. Yes, sir, but... But what? The pilot explained that his Valkyrie and the three next to it were on standby for Marshal Satui and his senior officers. Satui had finally graced the front line with his presence four hours before to oversee reinforcement phase. The marshal, who's a personal friend of mine, Gaunt said, will have to spare to you. I need transit right now. Urgent commissariat business. It's regular, sir, the pilot said. Look around, my friend, Gaunt said. Everything's irregular now. I can't exaggerate the importance of this. If I hang around and try to go through proper channels to get a bird signed, I'll be here for the rest of the night. If it helps, I'll sign off on a K426B requisition slip to say that I have commandeered you. You can always show that to your flight controller. The pilot studied, gone for a moment. There was no doubting his rank. The commissar was a mess. His clothes were ragged and filthy, and he had fresh scratches and consultations on his duty face, and an agony of fatigue in his pale eyes. He also appeared to have a shoulder wound. The pilot concluded this was probably not a man to cross. I'll clear off the fritters and get his up, sir, the pilot said, buttoning up his flight suit. Designation? Fifth compartment, Gaunt told him. Post 36. From the air, Sparsh Bonds was a sprawling, monstrous shadow, twitching with ten thousand spots of fire. They flew through reeking banks of smoke that blotted everything out, forcing the pilot to fly by instruments in clearer patches. Once they were over the second compartment, Gaunt could see the columns of troops in armor advance threading up into Step City, long winding rivers of lamps and headlights flowing through the dark. Everything was coming. Von Voigt committed everything he had. Beyond to the north, the towering heart of the Mons rose, full of secrets and malice, implacable, immense, as solid as a mountain peak. It lowered above the outer compartments, half visible in the night, as ugly as a death threat. 
The Valkyrie flew on in, down the long fourth compartment, where yet more mighty rivers of military traffic flowed outward. A significant portion of von Voigt's commitment was heading for the bit of fifth compartment, a hot zone. Grant understood that the Imperial forces were at least making some headway in the fifth given the weight of the reinforcement coming through. He was hardly surprised. They came in under the Cyclopean arch and entered the fifth. Far ahead, down country, the baleful glow of a battle lit up the night. Amber and red, Gaunt sighted the post, brightly lit by radiant ground lights in stab beams. Over to the left of them, another long column of armor and transportation was moving north below. The Valkyrie circled in and began its descent towards the wide table of basalt west of the post that served as a landing pad. They touched down with a gently controlled thud, and the engine cycled down. Gaunt slid open the side hatch and jumped out, Ezra behind him. Do you want me to stay on sight, sir? The pilot called out. Gaunt nodded. Yes, thank you. As long as you can. Turn around checks, please. The pilot shouted to the approaching ground crew. Ten minutes! Gaunt and Ezra hurried up the path towards a house that served as the focus of the post. The low hillside area around it was encrusted with thousands of habitants, like barnacles on the skin of some sea monster. There was a din of engines from the nearby trackway, as the relief called them rotted past, without beginning or end. The post itself was bustling with personnel. Who's the post commander? Gaunt asked the passing Kostek NCO. That'd be Marshal de Bray, sir. Where can I find him? He's already gone forward to the front line, sir. So who's in charge here? Colonel Brigadier, sir. Supply, idiot. And where would he be? Encio shrugged. Maybe in the main dugout, or you could try. Never mind, Gaunt said. He walked past the Encio towards a figure he just spotted in the crowd. An old man, all on his own, watching, waiting. Gaunt began to walk faster, pushing through the crowds. The old man turned and saw him coming. Gaunt took a few last steps and dropped to his knees in front of him. Atiante, father. Whispered. Zay bent down and laid his hands on Gaunt's shoulders, gently urging him back to his feet. The priest gazed up to Gaunt's face. There were tears welling in Zale's eyes. I've seen plenty of life, I have. Zale said, but the sight of you here gives me the most joy. It's good to see you too, said Gaunt. He swallowed hard. I've been a long time without blessing, father. Too long. My sins are heavy on me. Sometimes I think they're too heavy now to be lifted away, even by the Binti. She's a strong lass, Dale said. I'm sure she'll be up to the job. Zale continued to stare into Gaunt's face. By all that's holy, Abram. You have been to hell, haven't you? Or a different name, but yes. I like the beard, though, said Zale. Zale? led Gaunt up towards the post-command, his arm linked around Gaunt's for both comfort and support. Antiyati Zviel, permanently ancient, had become much more old and frail since the last time Gaunt had seen him. Gaunt's here. Yes, yes, you've lost weight too, have you not been eating, father? And you're hurt, these scratches on your face. Yes, father, uh, there was a barrel. And your shoulder. What's wrong with your shoulder? A wound. It's just a flesh wound. Zvail tutted. Flesh wound. Flesh wound. There are flesh wounds. No one ever says, Oh, look, I've been shot in the bones. But it missed by my flesh completely. The load of old nonsense. It's what it is. The phrase you heroic warrior types taught out. So you can sound manly and stoic. Bah! It's just a flesh wound. 
Only a flesh wound I can carry on. Tui. Nonsense. Father, I've heard men say that when there's a leg come off. Father Zell. Zell suddenly leaned close and whispered up into Gaunt's ear. I don't want to worry you, Abram, my dear boy. There's a very large man following us. Very large. Great tall fellow. Looks pretty sinister to me. But I'm sure you're aware of him. Ever vigilant, coiled spring that you are. Gaunt halted and turned. Ezra, come here. Tanithgain approached. Ezra Apneis. But the Grillion until. This is my old friend, Father Zeal. Father Amhava Antanati. The towering partition nodded slightly in Zveil's direction. Bidialo Idririn, he said. What did he say? Zvil asked, sidelong to Gaunt. Greeted you. He's very tall. Alarmingly tall, say. You're very tall, sir. Worth thirty. I said you're very tall, tall. Tall! Zvil gestured with his hands above his own head. Tall, you know. Not short. What, Eldrin? <clears throat> Is he simple in the head, Ibram? He doesn't seem to understand. Ezra looked questioningly at Gaunt, nodded towards Zé, and plucked his fingers away from his lips. <laughs> no, that's all right, Gaunt said. I've suffered him this long. That's quite a rude gesture, wasn't it? Zé whispered to Gaunt. He just made a rude gesture toward me. No, father. He was just concerned for my welfare. <laughs> Tall is one thing, rude is quite another. Strange acquaintances you pick up in your travels, Gaunt. I've often thought so. Gaunt smiled. Now, was Brown. In here, in here, Zwe muttered, pushing open the doors into the ward of the infirmary. The smell of counterseptic and body waste suddenly filled the air. Medicaid personnel were treating the latest batch of wounded ship back from the fifth compartment front line. This way. Bear called breezily. Apparently oblivious to the suffering around him, he strode on into the field theater. Gaunt followed him and came to a halt. The massive, badly damaged corpse of a semi-mature stalker lay on the theater bed. A mass surgeon was in the middle of a rigorous autopsy. The surgeon looked up at the interruption and slowly set down his bloodied instruments. He struggled for a moment to take off his goggles and mask, and then came quickly across the room to Gaunt and embraced him. Throne of terror, Ibram! Hello, Dolan. Dorden took a step back. Let me look at you, he said. Beth, is that really you? In the flesh. That's why I thought brought him to you first, Doctor. Zvea said. So you can look at him. He's a flesh wound. He says in the flesh, precisely in corporis mortaris. He's blessed us. He's fine. But you know these warrior types. Off comes the leg, they blither on regardless. You're hurt, Dorden said. Leg, is it? Just ignore there for a moment. I scraped a shoulder. You can look at it later. Ron's here, isn't he? Dorden nodded. Was this his idea? Gaunt asked, gesturing to the autopsy. One of your lot suggested it, actually. A Commissar Novabaski, he's with Raun. They dragged this carcass out of the scrub with them. Find anything? Gordon shrugged. Yes, things I'd rather not have found, but I'm still collecting data. I need to see Raun. You know where he is? The hunting party was waiting in one of the larger happy tents outside the infirmary. Dorden led Gaunt across with Zil and Ezra behind them. Gaunt went inside the tent and embraced Crid, Val, and Belton, Bonin. Bonin shook him firmly by the hand. The ghost greeted Ezra warmly too, though the partition made no response. Ron waited, facing Gaunt. Um, 
Um, same old, same old, eh? There's only water. Tell me what you have. Introductions first, Ron said. This is Coslim. It hit first. I've heard a lot about you, sir, Coslim said. And this is Kamazar Novrbaski. Gunt? Novrbaski nodded. Kamazar. Kamazar. Gunt nodded back. Over there, said Ron. That's recon trooper Cornithius. On the cots there, recon trooper Mags, and, well, McCall. The oh, devils, said Zveil. McCall and Mags were supine on the bed. Were supine on the simple bed, frames. Both of them were hooked up to machine drips and biofeeds. Both looked unconscious, cold pinched. What's wrong with them? Gaunt asked. They went through it, though, Ron said. They left this planet entirely for a few minutes. Dordan says they're hypothermic and run down, but they'll live. They left this planet entirely for a few minutes, Gaunt reported. Repeated. The proof you were asking for. The proof you were asking for, Ron asked. Said. Start from the top. Round recounted the hunting mission for a few minutes. What detail he left out was readily reinforced by Val Nevbraski and Belton. Bonin said the back of the skull was the weak point, so that's what I did, Belton complained. He already killed the stalker that way. Kill the stalker by stabbing in the back of the head. Not asked Bonin. Yeah, sure, the scout. They're not armored in the back. That's not the point I was trying to make, sir. Belton continued. I tried it. On good faith, then. Let's move along, said Gaunt. Comes on, Nobraski. Maybe you'd like to report. Nobraski nodded. I can only confirm what these people have told you, Gaunt. The stalkers clearly enter the compartment via portals. Warp gates, I don't know what you call them. They're like uh, trapdoors, letting the bastards out after dark. Right in amongst us. This is the character of the Mons, you think? Nubraski shrugged. The various standing stones in the interior terrain seem to be like the focal points of the gates. <laughs> Tron, I don't know. I'm no expert in these things. In my opinion, the Mons are wired to let them through. It builds into the architecture, established warp gates network, so... I don't know where... This isn't a level playing field. The stalkers themselves, Gaunt asked, looking at Dordan, who was standing at the doorway of the happy tent. Tissue samples say they're organs, Dordan said, with some human genetic material. Creatures are some vicious, unique, or program. Their brains are modified for absolute aggression. They're talking about human and... Orgrin specimens who have been stripped down, rebuilt, and programmed just to kill. Your proof? Dordan shook his head. I'm still collecting. I don't have the right instrument to back up here to be conclusive. But this is just a field hospital. Maybe if I had access to the body scanners and biopsy vaults at the Frag Flats or Turnial right now. But it's just a hunch. We do hunches, Ron said. Inklings too. Gaunt looked at Dordan. From what you've seen, Doctor, you'd say that they were modified human or human allied troops. Dordan nodded. The corpse I was autopsying, it had dog tags buried in the flesh of its throat, I mean, overlapped by skin graft and regrowth. The tags identified a trooper Olios Oliograd, 5th Storm Fraction Orgrin, 21st Hungarian Regiment. Checked it out. The 21st is currently in action on Mandold. They're sending our own people back to fight us. They're sending our own people to fight us. Rasky said. Seems so, Gaunt replied. And they're sending them back through punctures in the warp. Anyone here remember... That Jagengash? Jagengash? He asked. 
Roon, Val, Creed, and Bonin nodded. Bilton moaned at the memory. A what? asked Novobrasky. But Gon had already moved on. A cool. And uh, what was his name? Mags? They went through. He asked. And came back alive, Gon replied. Want to talk to them? Gaunt said. Dorden injected something powerful into McCall's drip and nursed him back into consciousness. Five minutes. Five minutes, he told Gaunt. That's all I'll allow. Gaunt nodded. He crouched down at McCall's bed, sighed. On. Hey, on. It's Gaunt. Never come back. McCall? Thought you'd never come back. McCall slurred, opening his eyes. You're going to be fine, on. Dorden say so. I just want to talk to you. The doc, I'm not going anywhere. What did you see, on? What in the fifth did you see over there? Cole rolled over and stared through the roof of the happy tent. Mags went through, so... I followed him. Never leave man behind. It's what you always taught me. I did. I did. So I went after him. It was cold, that place. <clears throat> really cold. I knew at once that I'd stepped off Oxion Sextus completely. I was... Uh, somewhere. On... Sorry, sorry, drifting, drifting off. I was somewhere else, the, the stars weren't right. That was the first thing I noticed. The constellations were entirely different. I navigate by the stars, notice these things. Go on, on. It was cold. D uh, did I mention that? I, I mean, really cold. Rock slabs. Everywhere you looked. Mags was shouting about the sky, and I noticed that too. I could see star patterns, but directly overhead it was a roof, ceiling, massive blocks of stone hanging in the night sky. It made no sense. How could stones be just be hanging there? And they were so quiet. Quiet? Gaunt asked. Really? Really quiet. Really quiet. McCall whispered. They should have been making a huge noise as the sky filled the stone slabs. They were quiet. His voice faded away. Dordan reluctantly pushed another veil to the drip. No more. No more. He told Gaunt. Gaunt nodded. On. Tell me about the place. Was it empty? No, 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 no. Uh, hordes of stalkers, massing to attack. Inhuman things, too. Machines, war machines, blood packed. We ran. We tried to hide the stalkers. They came after us, the rut ones. I saw legions of the damned. Assembled in mass, waiting for the gates to open. The gates. You have to understand. McCall murmured. There's nothing inside the lawns. It's empty. It's just a gateway. A massive gateway. Sucking us in so it can open and destroy us. The gates in each compartment don't lead into the next compartment along. I saw them laid out in a row. Opened somewhere else. Oh. That's enough, Dordan. Laid out in a row. They open to somewhere else. Nicole, that's enough, snapped Dordan. He's passed out again. Ezra suddenly unharnessed his rainbow, moved to the entrance. What is it? Rawl asked. He and Creed switched round tracing their weapons onto the mouth of the tent. Bright lights were flickering outside. Gaunt rose, hearing the whine of a gunship. 
Put your guns away, he said. You too, Ezra. Been waiting for this. The tent flaps pulled aside and the Kamzera troopers came in, firearms raised. Nobody move, the squad leader said, playing his hail gun around the tent. Nobody did. Not even wrong. His pistol aimed squarely at Gaunt. Bogart entered the tent. Behind him came Commissar General Belshin, Inquisitor Velt, and Noom Lud. You will send yourselves to the authority of the Commissariat, Bogart barked. End of the road, Gaunt, Belshin smiled. I'm really very sorry, sir, Lud said. All right, that's going to do it for now. There's, I think, like three chapters left, maybe four. <laughs> so I'll do the last few chapters in the next video. We have finally made it past the point, uh, to the point, actually, of where I last left off on reading the book when I originally uh, read it for the first time. So everything else after this chapter... I have no idea what happens. So far in this book, from the first chapter all the way up to now, is back in high school when I actually started reading the book. I never finished it until... <laughs> what is it? 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. Seven years later? <laughs> I'm barely gonna finish this book. Seven years later? Dang. That, that's a long time to just sit there and just try and read a book. It's not like I didn't try to. It's more of, I never really got into the book until, well, I started posting it on YouTube. <laughs> chapter by chapter, of course. I really wanted to just continue reading the book all the way up until like maybe chapter what was it was, uh, 24 like finish with chapter 24 and the rest of the last three chapters afterwards were for um, the next video afterwards you know like 3-3 three, three, and they just have it like really long videos in between but my vocal cord is, uh, I'm getting a little sore after doing this for <laughs> three hours. <laughs> uh, burr, burr, burr. Anyways, let us say thank you to our ongoing Patreon support members of the channel. Cesar E. Lopez, Jamie Davidson, Ricky Brown, Matas, Jaw Sickles, Azuth89, Thompson235, Starboard, Lilac NPC, Ken S. Mike... Force is unam. Eldrick Modred. The gay proceeder. And Kokoa. Thank you all for being an ongoing Patreon support member of the channel. If you want to be a Patreon support member of the channel, you can too in the link in the description below. Please, if you do become a Patreon member of the channel, um, send me a message from there. So I can check. I haven't been on there in, I think, a month. So if you joined in the last month, I'm sorry for not being able to add you onto the uh, background card or into the end a uh, video thing. This little moniker, whatever this is. <clears throat> yeah, I'm sorry to feel it. Yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> Up next, we're going to be doing two chapters of The Greater Good for Kaifus Kane. Chapter 14 and Chapter 15. I'm going to be trying to do two chapters since I haven't done that many videos in a good while. If I can do two chapters for Kane, because that actually looks pretty thick. Oh. Oh, geez. That is a, a good number of pages. What the. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10 pages. Eeeeh. Uh, maybe just do one page. 
I also have two other books that I am going to be reading on the channel. We have Fabius Bio, Clone Lord, and Apocalypse, Space Brain Conquest. I know they're both not the first of the series uh, for Fabius Bio or Space Brain Conquest, but I like twos. So, I'll be uh, reading those sometime soon in the future. Be on the lookout for those, because uh, I am excited to read Fabius Bile. Also, 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 soon to come up this month is going to be more... Uh, let's see. I have all these books right here next to me. We've got the Imperial Infantryman Handbook. Reading the next segment for that. We also got some of Heralds of the Siege from the Horus Heresy and finishing off Corthonia's Reckoning. And getting back into the horror of things, because that is coming up soon. And I'll probably have all the videos set up and ready to go for that by the time Halloween actually does come around. <laughs> I like to celebrate Halloween like two to three months earlier than I should. But again, that is just me. Anyways, I've been me, you've been you. Thank you for watching another one of these videos. I hope you enjoyed this. And... Have yourselves a good... Morning, afternoon, or night. Whenever you're listening to this, stay safe out there. Have yourself a good one. I can't wait to see you in the next one. Goodbye.